in fast definitions. And out of all the tests which are done, SAP is the only test, uh, automated perimetry, which is useful in advanced glaucomas. That too, the standard strategies 30-2, 24-2 are not very valuable. But if we look at this chart, when we, uh, when we look here, in the advanced glaucoma, SAP and the quality of life or visual functions are so close to each other, whereas it's not so in early glaucomas. So the field is almost a sheet anchor in the end when we are dealing with advanced glaucomas. There have been numerous uh, ways to classify it, AGIS, GSS, EGSS, but the standard, function, standard is still not there. AGIS only took into account um, mean deviation, whereas others are taking PSD also into, into account. So PSD is more specific to axonal loss. So it is a shade better, but it's still it is not available for clinical practice. So uh, for the coding, it's very important. Now we put everything in software. So American Academy is given 365 is the glaucoma code, double X is the type of glaucoma, and 73 is for the severity. And this is what we should be coding when we're coding our documents. So uh, AGIS has given us some important things that in African Americans, LTP was useful, not valuable to really us over here. But what is useful to us is that higher IOP fluctuations and age, they are related to progression and more advancement. And the reduced risk of progression is in the patients whose uh, IOP is by and large under 18 and uh, consistently under 14. They are the better of patients. So um, this is the classification which we are using mostly for clinical perspective. And in this, MD more than 12, both the hemifield involved, half the points below 5%, quarter points under 1%, and one odd point near the fixation, zero. So uh, why these patients need more care? Because they're left with so little in their lives that whatever they have is extremely important. So more than physical that they keep falling, that they can't drive, they can't read properly, they have a very negative impact on the mental health. They are very, very depressed people. So therefore, their morbidity and mortality, not only because of glaucoma, but even from other diseases, is a lot more. So this group, we need to be really careful. The cost of treatment, if you look here, is directly proportional. More advanced the glaucoma, more the cost. So if a patient happens to be poor and having advanced glaucoma seems to be almost a curse. So making of what remains. So when the patient loses vision in glaucoma, it doesn't mean patient is NPL. That is the point I want everybody to know. Even a small temporal island or central five degree field left is important for the ambulatory functions. And this is where we must take into account that, that PL should remain because that will count into a few finger counting and all that patient at least can go to toilets. So what do they need? Uh, a normal glaucoma patients have protocols, but here what we need to do is we need to monitor them a little more frequently. They have to come more often. Intraocular pressure not done by optometrist resident should be done by the consultant for the thing. We, we maintain the targets lower. We do visual fields a little more often. What fields we do will come to a little later. They need to go more often under surgery because the kind of pressure reduction we need doesn't come really by medications that much. Keeping in view the irreversible nature of glaucoma and ever-increasing life expectancy, this really needs to be looked into very seriously. And identification of progression is one of the most important things in this. Limitations are that Humphrey 10-2 and macula, uh, when it's really temporal island left, doesn't really help. Disc photos, when the whole rim is lost, is not is nearly not useful. So what we can do is whatever is possible out of whatever we have, we can look something into visual field, something into disk, something into automated perimetry, and maybe OCT, not the standard, but the GCC may give some idea because floor effect comes much later. So visual fields, we change the strategy from 10-2, uh, sorry, from 24-2 to 10-2. That doesn't work. We change the stimulus size to size 5. That doesn't work. A macula, that doesn't work. Macula size 5. If that doesn't work, just a plain and simple raw data, even that doesn't work, we can go back to our sweet old Goldman per, uh, perimeter. And the isopter shrinking is a very good idea. Uh, it gives a very good idea as to patient is getting worse. So this is 24-2 to 10-2. If you look at it, just the central points are enhanced. This is from 10-2 to macula. Then finally, this raw data and uh, progression analysis. From 12 dB minus to 20 dB minus, we will get a progression analysis on GPA. But if it's 20 dB and beyond, GPA is defunct. So let's not get into too much of gamut and uh, rely more on what we are seeing clinically in the numbers. 
this photography. Usually we are not left with too much of rim. In case the rim is left, we can see the thinning of the rim. But what is important here is why we are seeing these hemorrhages. These hemorrhages are a very indirect evidence that retina is getting, uh, the disc is getting ischemic and is getting worse. Second thing is parapapillary atrophy. Parapapillary atrophy is inversely proportional to the rim thickness. So when the rim is not visible, this atrophy is getting wider and wider. It's another indication that we are getting worse. Uh, there's something called automated alternation flicker. So these, this is, an, uh, this is a software which picks up pictures and does, um, what is that called, pixel by pixel analysis. And it can give a few microns which we miss on the naked eye. I recently they're trying to couple with a stereo photo. So this, this when available for clinical practice may be useful. Role of OCT. Standard OCT really has no role in, no role means no role in advanced glaucoma. But what can be of use is a GCC because macula is almost 300 microns thicker whereas the RNFL is around 100. So this floor effect comes the moment uh, MD is minus 12 dB, floor effect comes on OCT. But if we, do, we keep on doing macular thickness, we may be getting some amount of idea. So uh, structure function index is another thing which is of, again, statistical importance. But if the structural function uh, uh, index is higher, means there is more glaucoma damage, and it's slower, then it's less glaucoma damage. Alternative method. VP, PERG are of no value at all. Visual acuity is a very important thing we all can do in our clinics. If a patient is complaining of fluctuation vision that I can read at one time, I can't read another time. So if there is fluctuation of two lines or more in a day in a patient, it is significant as an indicator of progression. Kinetic perimeter, I already told, shrinking of isopters with grade five, um, size five stimulus. Then Amsler grid is so underrated otherwise, but in advanced glaucomas, when the field is so small, the, the, the consistency of this is 92% sensitivity is there in patients who have advanced glaucoma. So this is another test we, for which you require no investment really. The most important is listen to your patient and listen very carefully. It's a patient who tells, my things are getting a little white, vision is fluctuating a lot, I was able to read, I'm not able to read. I was able to see in a little, little darkness, but I'm not able to see at all. I need to have huge amount of light. The contrast is going. I'm falling more often. So the simple thing is, aapki zindagi kaise chal rahi hai? Ek sentence will, will actually get a lot more than we'll get out of the entire gamut. And at that stage, it's not, to, not only about mod, moderating the treatment, certain amount of emotional help, talking empathically is really useful. So we should, whatever empathy, love, affection we have, I think this is the group we should withhold from everybody else and give to these people because emotional support with whatever little they're left with is very, very useful. So treatment appro approach, more, these patients require more surgery. So, so when do we intervene? And how low can be the target pressure? Uh, there are really no guidelines. More is better or less is better. Lots and lots has been said, but how I look at it, that if patient has got advanced disease, we go by a thing that 40 pounds reduction and all that. See if it's progressing or not by whatever methods we have. If it is progressing, then, or we are not able to judge, then we again go back to the lowest possible that we can keep. F above 15 is never a good idea. So what we really get is, more than five, six is not compatible. So something between say six to 10 or 11, 12, it is a good target pressure for this group provided we are able to judge progression, which is a really million, million, million dollar question. And uh, if they're left only with temporal island, again, we just go on patient's history. This is one nice thing I found is one doctor said, I hedge my bets on surgical options because surgery has different kinds of complications or uh, risk factors. And progression has different risk factors. So one eye surgery and one eye no surgery. If a patient is more prone to surgical complications, we'll lose the operated eye. More prone to otherwise progression, we'll lose the not operated eye. So at least we'll have something. It's, it's just a person's perception. We need to put it in patients using our own uh, skills. So believe in glass half full. Half empty doesn't work. Some patients will go blind. We have to accept it, but we should save whatever we can save. And the guideline is if a patient comes with advanced damage at the time of onset when presence first, about one third of them will go blind. And the other eye also, if we take carefully, then we can take a long way. So good news is that we now have much better tools than we had before. And these results may not be very specific and sensitive as on now, but they're progressing. So with that in mind that whatever we have, we should use, but the most important sense in advanced glaucoma is your clinical sense. And let's not rock this boat. 
let's allow it to flow. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Madhu, for very comprehensively describing the diagnosis and management of advanced glaucoma. Now I would like to invite Dr. Sagarika. She is going to talk about each millimeter drop in IOP makes the difference, an artful scientific prescription of anti-glaucoma medications. I once again reiterate that this is Tiger Hill, which you can see, the pointed edge over there, and that is where the main battle was, fo was fought. And we continue our fight against advanced glaucoma, dedicated to all our brave soldiers who are fa fighting on the northern sector as well as in the eastern sector. We have to understand that every millimeter of mercury drop of intraocular pressure is going to make a difference to these patients of advanced glaucoma. So how are we going to deal with this? It's only when we have a good knowledge of the medicines that we are instilling, at what time we have to instill, how do we instill? Why is the patient not being compliant? Is he really not being compliant? Or is, he, is there some other mistake? Are some things that we need to go into when we are dealing with these patients? Look at this. This is only half a prescription of a patient with advanced glaucoma with all these drugs. We must remember that advanced glaucomas can occur in anybody. It may be a young child. It may be a juvenile. It may be among the middle aged, it may be amongst the old. We must not just think that advanced glaucomas occur in the old. And therefore, some drugs can be given to children, some drugs cannot be given to children, some drugs should be taken into consideration about the systemic considerations that the patient is having some other disease and therefore this drug perhaps may not act. So I'm going to go into all this and tell you all about how, what all we must look at. Our aim in advanced glaucoma, as Mrs. Badoria said, is basically let's reduce the intraocular pressure by at least 40%. How low should we go? Now, it has been found, it has been said by Dr. Pascal that patients with advanced glaucoma need intraocular pressure at the episcleral venous pressure level. And it has also been found that medications, laser, laser trabeculoplasty, blebless glaucoma surgery, almost never achieve IOP levels required by patients with advanced disease. And suppose you lower it so much so that the pressure becomes only five or six, then you have the other disadvantage that the patient may go into, of course, hypotony, myculopathy. Therefore, how much should the pressure be is a major problem. And this therapeutic window of intraocular pressure for advanced glaucoma is very narrow. Now, what do we do, therefore? Should we go in for surgery? Should we go in for, med for medical treatment? The CIGTS said that there is no difference between the two. And as per the, there have been the randomized clinical trials which compared the outcomes of medical laser and surgical, there's, it, there, it's lacking. And there is no uniformly accepted best treatment option for advanced trachoma. Of course, recently, it has been said in UK that patients who are presenting with advanced glaucomas should be offered primary glaucoma surgery. But another, King et al. have said the current evidence does not support this recommendation. And when we looked at the meta-analysis, there is insufficient evidence to determine how well recently available medications work compared to surgery in more severe POAG and which is the cost-effective option. So we're in a catch-22 situation, surgery, versus medicine. Now suppose, let's say for example, we are looking at advanced glaucomas and we are going in for surgery, which we would like to. In that case, we find that the target intraocular pressure is extremely important. Greater the glaucoma damage, try to lower your intraocular pressure as low as is possible. Look at what all other comorbidities that the patient has. Does he have diabetes, hypertension, pre-existing damage in the other eye? Does he have a family history of glaucoma, etc.? Why? Because every time he has a risk factor, you have to reduce the intraocular pressure that much. And if you look at all the medical medicines that have come up, right from 1862 onwards, we find that we are much better off. We have now a gamut of various types of drugs. And what would we choose, possibly, the least amount of medication or medications with the most likelihood of lowering intraocular pressure, keeping the costs absolutely minimal, causing minimal or uh, no side effects to the patient is something that we must consider. And therefore, the artful science 
of scientific prescription for the patients. PGAs, we all know, very good superior intraocular pressure lowering efficacy, no tachyphylaxis, very convenient single day dosing. Both diurnal and nocturnal pressures can be relieved, can be controlled. And more important than that is that PGAs are said to lower the intraocular pressure even beyond 24 hours. Suppose a patient misses one dose, at least we know the intraocular pressure will be also controlled. Of course, there are side effects, but not compared to the effects and the good effects that it gives us. Therefore, PGAs are most effective IOP lowering agents, lowering it to approximately 28 to 31 percent from trough as well as the peak points. If we compare all the commonly available drugs to us, especially in our country, we find that there's practically no difference. There is one drug, uroprostone, which is given BD, otherwise everything is given uh, OD, and preferably HS, of course. There is conjunctival hyperemia, there are ocular side effects, but if we try to avoid the back, therefore when you are giving a drug, have a look what is the preservative that the drug is in. So if you have, let's say, it's been preserved in soft zoya, for example, like Travatan, then we realize it is much better for the patient's ocular surface and extremely good for the patient. Tafluprost, I have found, does do a much good, a very good effect. It's preservative free. Now we have, again, preservative free, latinoprost, bimatoprost. There are very few systemic side effects of these drugs. What about the beta blockers? I, I have presented this only for one reason, that let's not forget bitoxolol. There are many patients in which bitoxolol also works. We all know its effect is not as good as timolol, but let's not forget that it does decrease the intraocular pressure. But when we are giving the beta blockers, we have to check, does the patient have any respiratory heart disease, risk for hypoglycemia, any thyroid, or thyroid disease or myasthenia gravis? Very, very important, let's not forget, because in the older patients especially, along with advanced disease, and even in the younger ones, are they having anxiety, depression, fatigue, impotence, etc.? Let's not forget that these drugs can cause it. So the good is ocular tolerability, very good. Most patients say very, very comfortable. Not so good. Systemic beta blockers, the patient is already known. We do not even look at what medicine the patient is on. He may be on metoprolol, and here we're giving a beta blocker. So the efficacy definitely is reduced. So beta blockers definitely reduce the IOP lesser than PGAs. And nocturnal IOP does not get reduced. This is something that we must remember. And there are certain cardiovascular side effects and bronchial side effects. Plus, if the patient is not compliant, we are going to remember that impact on IOP is very good because it doesn't continue for so long. A very important thing, formulation. If you give the timolol hemihydrate and gel-forming solution, they are better tolerated than the timolol maleate in potassium sorbate. And the gel, of course, causes a lot of blurring of vision. Alpha agonists. Of all these drugs, the brimonidin is the one that we are all using. And we have 0 0.1, 0 0.15, and 0.2, two to three times daily, good efficacy. It reduces the pressure by about 17% compared to the around, let's say, 25, 28 to 31% of PGAs. And it reduces at peak and trough also. But unfortunately, it is, we land up with lots and lots of allergies. Lots of puride preservatives are available along with these drugs, which are well tolerated by the patient. But these side effects which we keep seeing in our patients, let's not forget that oftentimes you start the patient on an alpha agonist and the drug has to be stopped. There are plenty of side effects of these drugs. Let's not forget them. Remember, depression is common to both beta blockers and this one. There can be a lot of systemic hypotension, etc., which I'll not go into, but very important. Then comes the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Brinzolamide, very nice drug, patient is very comfortable, reduces intraocular pressure slightly lesser than that of dorzolamide, but very well tolerated by the patient, which the patient feels very good about. Dorzolamide, unfortunately, more effective, but it has got, because of the pH value, that is why it causes a lot of stinging and patient is very uncomfortable. Don't forget to ask about sulfonamide toxicity in all patients who have been given acetazolamide tablets systemically. So when we are going to start a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, we have to check, look at the endothelial function, especially when using it for topical use. And does the patient have any hepatic or renal impairment when using it for systemic use? Meiotic agents, one group of drugs, which I still remember Dr. Hiota talking about, that don't forget pilocarpine. It's a very good drug. And we can use it for many, many cases. And it does, of course, have a lot of side effects. Now we have combinations, and we all know about the combinations, and we can use it for many patients, especially the beta blockers, along with many other drugs. 
and combinations are associated with much lesser short time fluctuation than beta blockers alone. And there are some drugs which are said to have neuroprotective effects. Do we should, should we use them because of that? We don't know. But as such only, they reduce the intraocular pressure. Now we have to instruct the patient. Advanced glaucoma means you take much more care of that patient. Therefore, you stand and see how does the patient instill the drug. And so I'm going to just show you a short video as to how. Sorry. So you shake the bottle well and show it to also the relative who is there. Then make a pocket of the lower lid, pull it outwards, bend the head slightly backwards, put just one drop. And keep harping on the point, put one drop. And then gradually ask the patient to gently close the lid. Sometimes they just swap it shut and everything falls out. And tell them not to put more than one drug, one drop because everything falls out. After that, teach them how to do the punctal uh, occlusion. That way, whatever drug is, being go is going into the patient's eye, remember it's going to have its effect. How many medications to, drug to give? One drug with the greatest efficacy, go ahead and give it. Please don't forget that we have to look at the coexisting ocular diseases, precluding its usage, side effects, cost of drug is very, very important. And we have to understand that this disease is asymptomatic. Patient doesn't understand what is going on in his eye. Therefore, he is prone to poor compliance. He realizes that I can't see anything better than when I was putting the, before I was putting the drug. Again, he stops it. The side effects he feels are probably worsening the o o ocular condition. Sit down, explain to him that, look, that is not the case. Let the side effects be, but your intraocular pressure is reducing. And therefore, just don't change the drug by that. Explain to the patient, speak to him, and only continue with the drug. So let's summarize. What is it? Don't give a beta blocker after sunrise. It's not going to have an effect. I still remember 6 o'clock and 6 o'clock is what we, are, we were following, and we are still continuing that. Dorzolamide, it is very viscous, and therefore it should be the last one to be instilled because it will prevent the penetration of other drugs, making a layer on the corneal epithelium. PGA is preferable to give it at night, but if the patient says for some reason can't put it at night, please tell him to go ahead and put it even in the daytime. A combination of PG with Timolol. Remember, Timolol doesn't work at night, so preferably give it in the morning. Maybe 9 o'clock instead of AM, instead of PM, just make it AM. And uveitis, a PGA with brimonidin not to be given because of obvious reasons. If it is a hydrophilic anti-glaucoma drug without preservatives, it's not very effective. It's hydrophilic. It's not lipophilic. So as a result, there's poor penetration. And pilocarpine, as I said, is a very good drug to be used in aphakic, pseudophakic, circular cornea, PGAs, of course. Let's avoid them. And thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Sagarika. It was really nice. This nicely summed up and all the important points brought out. Now I'll request Sunita to focus on the imaging. Expand on what I said. <laughs> So at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Sagarika for having me in this course. I'll be talking on role of imaging and perimetry in advanced glaucoma. If you go through this glaucoma continuum, you can see that the disease progresses from a stage of undetectable uh, disease to the stage of functional impairment or advanced disease. And untreated glaucoma may cause blindness in 3 to 6, 15 years, depending on the rate of progression. Uh, an estimated 10 to 39 percent of the patients present with advanced glaucoma and more so in this part of the world. They present very late and with very, very advanced disease. And they are at the highest risk of becoming functionally impaired due to the disease and so needs monitoring. They require frequent visits to monitor their disease status in terms of intraocular pressure, structure and function to prevent progression and eventual blindness. The traditional diagnosis modalities include IOP measurement. However, as we know, uh, the, the importance of IOP is limited as there is higher inter-individual individual variability and diurnal fluctuation, and the values do not indicate whether damage has occurred and at what IOP level. The subjective evaluation of optic nerve head Again, depends on the observer skill. It has high inter and intra observer variability, and optic nerve evaluation may not be very useful in very advanced disease when there is hardly any rim 
uh, remaining. Uh, as Dr. Bhadoria described, you can have disc hemorrhage as a sign of progression. Visual field is still considered the gold standard. However, as we know, it shows a lot of variability, especially in patients with very advanced glaucoma, and necessitates multiple retesting to improve reliability. There has been an increasing use of imaging over the last decade, and in fact, general ophthalmologists use it more frequently than uh, the visual fields because of the ease of usage and performance. However, there's always a structure versus functional debate about which meta method is better, and especially in case of advanced glaucoma. And unfortunately, there are no currently accepted standards for detect detection of progression in advanced glaucoma. Now coming to the role of perimetry. So visual field changes may be the most important factor than only evidence in cases of advanced glaucoma. However, there are certain principles which need to be applied to optimize the detection of visual field changes. As we know, the standard uh, automated perimetry test retest variability is narrow when the sensitivity is pretty high, uh, but the, sen the, the, the variability increases when the sensitivity is reduced to 15, less than 15 decibel, especially in 24 to st CETA standard and 30 dash 2. And it is impossible to determine whether the progression is real or it's just a fluctuation. So repeating the sequence of testing more often will reduce the false positive rates to 2% from 50% uh, in one of the studies. So repeat testing is required in these uh, patients. Now coming to stimulus size, we commonly use Goldman size 3 in our uh, perimetry testing. The switching to size 5 have several advantages and especially for monitoring progression in um, patients with advanced glaucoma as it has an effective dynamic range. And a test location with a sensitivity of 15 decibel on size 3 stimulus shows 20 decibel in size 5. So it reaches the floor effect uh, later than uh, size 3 stimulus. And the contrast sensitivity uh, is known to increase the uh, stimulus with this uh, stimulus size. As the size 5 has 8 indiscriminable steps for detection of progression and a floor of 4 to 8 decibels as compared to 15 to 19 decibel in uh, size 3. So therefore, size 5 is more effective. As you can see here, there is a complete loss which is seen in size uh, uh, 3. And in size 5, you can still uh, monitor progression to, uh, uh, till a later date. Now coming to 10 days uh, 2 strategy. Uh, in advanced glaucoma, there is damage to the fixation or threatened fixation. So 24-2 is not a good idea, and you have to monitor on 10-2, and uh, where you can uh, detect the, the fixation loss, as uh, this uh, slide was shown earlier also, that it detects 68 points with two, distri uh, two um, degrees distance from the center as compared to six degrees distance in 24-2 uh, CETA. So this uh, can detect the central point much better and uh, detect the, uh, the central uh, scotoma much better uh, as compared to 24-2. So how to detect progression on 10-2? I think uh, what we do generally is point by point comparison and you can just uh, see how much more um, deviation is there in these points because PSD is going to improve as the loss becomes more generalized. So here you're going, going to get uh, lesser values, although MD will show deterioration. So you can just uh, compare point by point and see the deterioration. Glaucoma progression analysis is used in Humphrey uh, perimeter, uh, and it provides an automated identification of progression at each test location based on their uh, test retest variability. It has a regression analysis also, and it flags off whether there's a progression, likely progression or possible progression uh, with a high specificity. And, uh, but when the test locations are too depressed, it is, uh, uh, it shows X sign. That means uh, this no, can no more detect the progression at these points. And so the adjacent points can be considered to assess progression if it is 
uh, if the de de uh, depression in sensitivity is too high. However, 10-2 analysis does not have GPA. Maybe in the future algorithms it can be incorporated. So on 10-2 you don't have these GPA algorithm and you have to just compare on overview analysis. So what uh, we, uh, is recommended generally for advanced glaucoma is that, that you perform 10-2 fields in all patients with advanced glaucoma. And uh, size 5 can be considered uh, if uh, uh, you want to increase the dynamic range further. And even macular program can be used. And the goal is to be to able to obtain less variable estimates of visual field sensitivity and extend the time span with more reliable measurements. Now coming to imaging. As we know, RNFL measurements are often no, use, uh, uh, no longer useful in cases of advanced glaucoma, as the RNFL tends to a point when there is almost no residual ganglion cell with OCT, and significant loss of layer leaves behind a residual floor that no longer changes with ongoing progression. An article by Dr. Sihota et al. shows that in advanced glaucoma, the average RNFL thickness is 53, and in uh, blind eyes, it is uh, near 44. So beyond that, uh, it doesn't go less than that, and this is uh, the floor effect. And you do see uh, these cases clinically when the, case, uh, the, the patient is very advanced when, uh, with almost no rim uh, and a uh, lot of changes in the 10-2 with fixation involvement. You don't see deterioration in OCT. In fact, it shows a lot of variability, and you see this kind of result that's shown to be improved. Similar in this patient also, uh, with the very advanced case, the OCT changes are not very reliable. So you can't rely on these uh, very advanced cases with uh, no rim and uh, deterioration on visual fields. The OCT seems uh, to be uh, not showing any changes. So OCT is not very reliable, and uh, I, as we know, the ganglion cell thickness is, um, the macula has the maximum uh, ganglion cells, so it, uh, it is relatively uh, thicker, and even in advanced cases, it, uh, the floor effect occurs later in macular imaging. In a uh, study estimating OCT structural measurement flow to improve detection of progression, ganglion cell inner plexiform thickness was the most informative parameter, and so it was uh, suggested that it is better candidate for detecting progression as compared to RNFL. Then this is again uh, another software, BKDS, wherein there are uh, 3D changes are detected in the deeper layers and you can even delineate the lamina cribrosa. However, these uh, technologies are not freely available in our day-to-day -day practice and uh, however, they can be uh, useful for detecting structural changes in advanced glaucoma. And this has al also been uh, discussed by Dr. Madhu that you can use a combined structure function index and uh, these uh, uh, machines are now uh, available wherein uh, the RNFL thickness is uh, more or less same in both eyes, but one is very advanced glaucoma with a visual field index of 27 uh, and this one is uh, 51. So you can detect uh, changes better when you combine structure and function index. And in our day-to-day -day practice also, I think we uh, correlate all our findings, the clinical findings, and uh, as Dr. Madhu um, said that the patient's opinion is also very, very important in very advanced glaucoma. The patient uh, is symptomatic and the patient feels loss of contrast sensitivity and deterioration of vision, and you need to combine all these tests together to come to a conclusion. So diagnostic methods become more challenging and less reliable in late stages. So repeated tests are required. The frequency of tests will be um, uh, as uh, frequent as uh, three months in very advanced cases. 10-2 uh, strategy and size five are the gold standards for uh, detecting progression in um, advanced glaucoma. SDOCT has demonstrated some utility in monitoring progression by imaging deeper layers. Um, and uh, the macular imaging. However, co combination of structural and functional tests using information from one when the other provides inconclusive results is the best way to detect progression. And of course, uh, you need to uh, go by the patient's symptoms uh, to detect progression in these uh, and modify your treatment accordingly.
Thanks, Dr. Sunita. I think that was a very good talk. And, um, um, also, continue with the questions. Any questions um, the audience have with regards to um, the advanced glaucomas? I think it's very difficult once the patient already has advanced glaucoma to monitor progression. So, um, any tips, Dr. Sunita? What would you use if you had a patient with advanced glaucoma? Would you, um, I mean, you cannot monitor them on um, objectively on a 10 2 or. or hmm? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think vision is probably then pro probably, yeah, the symptomatic uh, uh, problems that the patient has would be given a lot of importance at that point of time. even if you don't get a perimetry, the symptoms of the patients are very important. You know, if the patient is saying that now I, I, I'm not seeing as well as I did before, then that could be an indicator that yes, probably the patient is progressing. But then you must also realize that the, once a disease is advanced, sometimes the patient sees good, sometimes he doesn't see, feel so good. You know, sometimes he says, sometimes he does not say. Therefore, you will have to monitor, call him more frequently to your OPD, okay, and judge whether Actually, he thinks he's going bad. And if he, he's going bad, then obviously you need to do something. One more thing which I think is very important for us to follow up in these glaucomas is check whether really the pressure is low throughout the day. So that dynal variation also, which is very important because the patient may come to you at a particular time of the day and actually his pressure may be slightly higher and that's why he's progressing. So every means that you have in your hand, try to detect if there is any fluctuation. If you can stop that fluctuation also, that will also help you. Then depending on when the pressure is going high, accordingly you change your drug or change the timing. Professor Sihota, would you like to add something more, ma'am, to, to this particular question? Because you deal with so many advanced glaucomas, ma'am. The patients are also generally elderly. So you have age-related problems relating to 
the amount of light that is required, the uh, mm -hmm. contrast. So you have to actually use the symptoms, but also use the symptoms, keeping in mind that with age also these things change. So don't rely highly on, on symptoms, but patients will tell you that if it's within two or three months, then it's definitely something that you need to worry about. But if it's happening over, say, six months, a year, then I think you have to also say that there's a little bit of uh, a problem with age. And if your IOPs are sort of eight, 10, up to 12, I think, then you've done a, a, a really good job in keeping the patients compliant. And most of them do extremely well. I think if you can keep the level at, at, at that level, I wouldn't agree with those earlier studies. I think you showed us a study of 1998 saying that 15% of people go blind bilaterally, 27 go blind unilaterally. Those are old studies where we didn't have good drugs. Yeah, yeah, they're very old studies. So I think the, the prognosis is very, very good these days. But the, the thing is that the ophthalmologist has to be equally adept Proactive. at keeping the pressures low. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think Dr. Rita also wants to say I something. Perfusion, perfusion pressure. Yeah. yeah, I think that's really great. And uh, Dr. Keithi, please, if you don't mind, just mention it. One please. small doubt. How frequently they should be followed up? Like advanced glaucoma once in a month and once in two months. How frequently they, they should be followed up for the vision? What are the forums they get? Yeah. back the patient as, as often as possible. But on the other hand, that you have done a good surgery, pressure is 10, 12, and the patient is more or less stable, you maybe probably four months, six months, you can call them and, and, and see them again. Every time you have to go in for the fields and all the stuff. Yeah, more, um, and of course the pressure, yeah, you see. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So that was a very um, interactive session. That, that means everybody is interested and not sleeping. That's great. So I'll be talk, talking, uh, and thanks to Sagarika for having me here. So I'll be talking on surgery in advanced glaucoma, and the three pictures tell you all. Precision, prayer, and keep your ego in your pocket. So uh, this has been highlighted that advanced glaucoma is very, very commonly there in our setup. Almost 40 to 5, 42% patients come to us in my setup with advanced glaucoma, and 25% patients are blind in one eye. And uh, somebody just said the problem of adherence and the follow-up. And the, remember, most of these patients are elderly. They don't, may not have a caregiver to bring them, the motility problems, finance, of course, and the geographical lab problems. So each of them makes that surgery is very often the only resource. And we have to hit hard and we have to hit well because we have a very low threshold left for any mistakes because it's already advanced glaucoma. And we just talked about this IOP fluctuations, diabetes, smoking is a big problem. And we must remember that most of these patients do have these issues and this affects the perfusion pressure. So please remember when you are seeing advanced glaucoma and your pressure is progressing despite your all the treatment, just remember that these issues have to be kept in mind because we often forget we treat the patient as a whole and not just the eye and the pressure or the visual field or the disc. So please keep the entire patient in mind. And for surgery, so we have realized now that surgery is very often the only resource it is required. Now, but the problem is that as a surgeon, we often walk the razor's edge when we're doing the surgery because we have these risks. We are dealing with high pressures. We are dealing with increased risk of supercardial bleed, hypotony, aqueous misdirection, ODR, or snuff out. So the precautions to be taken are you lower the IOP as for any trap trap, but you should stop the aspirin and just keep the BP under control. That's very important, not just on the day of surgery, but for some weeks so that the perfusion comes in balance. You can do a paracentesis 30 minutes before. I learned this from Dr. Ramanjit that you can do that around 30 minutes before a paracentesis. Just walk around the OT, come back, and do a trab 
it has saved me and very often because I used to just could not control the pressures in this advanced glaucoma and above all you have to avoid hypotony. Just a brief re iteration of what surgery and glaucoma is, not going into the details. Please remember for a glaucoma surgery to succeed, you want an incomplete healing. You don't have to have a seamless healing because a seamless healing means a failed trap. So for that, you have to have the adequate aqueous, aqueous outflow. And for this, you have three targets which I'll be covering sequentially in my talk. Arrest or minimize healing and need to create a scleral valve which allows slow egress of aqueous, yet not a free flow, leading to hypotony, and recognize early signs of failure. So I won't be covering this for lack of time. I'll be covering the first two aspects. So for the first one, to arrest or minimize healing, uh, you have this blunt conjunctal dissection. All my residents know, and you know, I always tell them, treat the conjunctiva as you would a fiancé and not your wife. So be gentle with the conjunctiva because more trauma to the conjunctiva, more cytokines are released, more inflammation, and more the chance of scarring. And to follow the safe mitomycin technique, which has been taught to us by the Mofield guys, and have a widespread. Then uh, I have used very frequently or almost inevitably amniotic members the last 15 years and I'm very happy with my results as an antifibrotic uh, agent. I use it in addition to mitomycin, but very often in addition to a implant or on its own. And this is a brief video of... Uh, So this is uh, for advanced glaucoma. What, what the second thing you wanted was you want a controlled egress and you want to prevent the snuff out. You want a slow decompression. So once you've done the serial flap creation, you can place a pre-placed suture. So this is the pre-placed sutures in position. Many, many surgeons do it routinely. I do not. But for advanced glaucoma, I do, especially like this patient was a surge waiver, I think, if I'm not mistaken, and we do the pre-placed sutures. And I always do a titration because that really helps me in multiple places. So that's part of our routine. So it's a slow decompression. You count till 10, actually, 10, 9, 8, you know, before you do any. So that it's a slow decompression of at the keratome side and at the uh, side port entry both. And uh, I always use a releasable suture. I think most of us do. And use more than one suture because it prevents the eye from going from no to excess leaf. So you have two things in hand. You know, you to have one releasable, you can release it one time, and the second one in a sequential way. And this is the releasable suture of the Wilson's technique, which I learned from Richard Wilson. And it has served me very well for almost two decades now. There's an audio to it, I forgot. So this is, uh, these are two releasables being tied there. And this is on the slit lamp. I release the suture. I don't need an OT setup for this. And it's very easy to release, and they do not break in between. I'm a little hesitant about the uh, Cohen and Osher. Obviously, that's also a good option. But that's the one I've been using. And amniotic membrane is uh, placed there. This is another small clip of uh, how to use. So this is a, a posterior dissection has to be, this is a regular uh, trap, but for advanced glaucoma, the precautions are that you must do a gentle cautery, a slow decompression, and avoid using mitomycin excessively because that will, you have to use it, but it will also cause more hypotony and you can't afford a hypotony in advanced glaucoma. So I rely more on the amniotic membrane and because you need the blebs to be less avascular diffuse, slow decompression, reiterating, and must ensure a good intact conjunctival suturing that you don't have any bleb leak or a chance of hypotony post-op. And the releasable is a little tighter than normal in these patients and you sequentially release them so that you have a well, well uh, pressurized chamber at the end of surgery and in the immediate post-op. So these are the bleb anchoring sutures being in position and I'm very meticulous in that, that I titrate on table as you will see and ensure that there's no bleb leak. Many surgeons do leave it sutureless. I've seen it myself, but I'm not personally comfortable with that. So this is the titration happening at the end to show that it is watertight. And this is the model of, for those of you who can follow that, the releasable suture is you take the first bite from the corneal side come out from here, then take a loop back on the scleral flap, come out from here, 
at this next to the cornea and then tie the sutures together with two, th three, two, one knot, cut it flush, and this remains there. And on the slit lamp at the later time, you just pick this up and cut it, and the whole thing comes out. So this is a model which is there in my CME in the iOS series. You can go and, and you can check it out. And this is something which we have been using for the last so many years. And this is AMT bleb, which gives a very good microcystic spaces, less height, and it is little vascular, but more diffuse. So I prefer it over mitomycin any time. And this is a brief clip of um, how we titrate the bleb or continual suturing because I'm this for advanced glaucoma, as I'm say, saying, you really cannot afford any hypotony. And this is another way of, tight, of suturing. Though that one was the sutures were buried inside here. Uh, I have shifted to this now. I don't bury the sutures because afterwards my releasables and these get tangled up in the post-op period while removing it. So this is 9 and the releasables are 10 so the differentiation is there. So on the slit lamp, uh, both these sutures are removed on the slit lamp in the outpatient setup. So this is a horizontal mattress suture. And uh, this is a brief, uh, this thing of, uh, we have very often for advanced patients, we use a combination of amniotic membrane with the implant because as I said, I'm not very comfortable with mitomycin and recently I have shifted to mitomycin 0.5. Um, I was using one, uh, two milligram percent and then one and now we've shifted and the timing is for one minute or less because we are having a lot of, either it's a problem with the company or whatever, we are having a lot of uh, cystic blebs. So we've come down to the duration for the last six months or so. So uh, this really uh, works well, the amniotic uh, thing. And this is the patient, the OCD picture at one week with the new technique which we are doing now. I call it the smile technique, which is a marriage of convenience between the phonic space and the limbus space. And this is the ologen pleb at one week. And uh, last uh, uh, small video is on the AC maintainer. I use it very, uh, I don't use it that commonly. But if you have an advanced glaucoma where you have a chance of still collapse like you have in pseudophakia or ophakia, and then you would, or in Sturge Weber, you can use an AC maintainer, which will keep the AC formed. And incidentally, I always use viscoelastic when I do that. Have you seen, I just do the viscoinsufflation with methyl cellulose, not, uh, not helon at all. And this just remains there and keeps the AC formed. And later on, when you're doing the keratomy and, ever, and the PI, it just comes out. So that AC maintainer is another option which you can think of if you want to prevent hypotony on the table. And this is the, oh, sorry. This is the new technique which is a, we have developed for the last two years. I've been using these, and my just, uh, thesis just finished on that. The smile technique of incision, which is in between phonics and limbus based. And uh, because the, I give the releasable sutures at the ap apex. So once the, I release the releasable, the aqueous type flow is posteriorly. So for a posterior directed bleb, these, the scar forms here. So the ring of, ring of steel forms here. So it doesn't really matter that the bleb will not become overlying, overhanging pleb, and then the aqueous flow is posteriorly. So it has worked really well in our hands, and the astigmatism is far less. The patients are very comfortable. So uh, we, we just have just finished that thesis on the smile suturing technique. And this is the video of how the smile, it's very easily removed on the slit lamp. So uh, on the releasable suture is released on the slit lamp. This is a slit lamp picture, and the smile suturing is there. And this one, I'm releasing the uh, conjunctival suture on the slit lamp also. So it's, it's very convenient. It doesn't, doesn't cause any da discomfort to the patient, and they're very happy with this technique. And for, I'm using it for all glaucomas, but for advanced, especially when you don't have that safety net. So last, you can just... Just to recapitulate, you operate on a quiet eye with control pressures, do a paracentesis, do a diode laser. We've just published an article uh, on this, uh, how do we use a diode laser uh, for the safer trabeculate. We have high pressures, advanced glaucoma. You don't want to operate on an angry eye because of the risk of supracranial bleed or a malignant glaucoma. So do a DLCP, do it in 180 degrees inferiorly, and then plan for a trab around four to four weeks afterwards when the eye is quiet. And believe me, no patient has got thysis, no inflammation, and we've just published this recently, and it's been, we've been doing it for many, um, for many cases. And the other one is when you have advanced glaucoma and you have a DDLS of more than 7 and 8, macular split, stop the PG analogs. If it's a bad conch, do the tubes, and above all, take consent from the patient of all the risks. Have an informed consent, and so uh, just... Uh, 
the, this thing is that the messages that go for surgery with ego in your pocket, precision, prayer, and that's the this thing for the Kargil. Uh, can I just have this slide? Yeah. So salute to the Kargil people who really fought for us and made it possible for us to sit here today. And so I'm glad you labeled, named it Kargil at the Frontiers. So thanks to them. Thank you, Dr. Kirti. Uh, I would ask the audience, when you are operating, let's say, on advanced glaucoma, then in that case, do you do it on topical? Do you do it with peribulbar? What is it that you all do? Would peribulbar. So when you are using the peribulbar, then in that case, do you use any kind of com uh, compressive device, let's say, or a weight on the eye, let's say a pinky ball or a, uh, a balanced weight, to apply pressure on the eye? Anyone? So we should not do it. This is what I want to aim at. My aim of asking this question, Ma'am Bhadoria was almost having a heart attack over there. Yeah, because we do not want to put any pressure on the eye, whatever little perfusion is there, then that patient will lose that little bit of field of vision which she has before she, that patient comes onto the OT table. So that's one factor that we must remember. Second is when we are applying the pressure also, it should be a very gentle pressure. You should also remove your hands from the patient's eye so that the blood also flows into that. That means there's perfusion taking place also. So if anyone else would add, like to add something more to what I've said, you're more than welcome. Otherwise, I'll request Dr. Vinay, who's going to now tell us what is the quality of life of these people. And when we are dealing with these patients, what Colonel Bhadoria talked about, and that is deal with them with compassion because they have they have lost so much, they have a lot of life left, and we have to look after them. So over to Dr. Vinay, please. Thank you, um, Dr. Sagarika. I'm going to talk about um, what happens to these patients uh, and their quality of life once they have advanced glaucoma. So um, what is quality of life? Actually, the, the definition has changed over a period of years to, to the uh, new WHO definition, which says that it is physical, psychological, social as well as the spiritual well-being of a patient. Um, in 1960, the Americans spent one billion per year on health and, and today they're spending one billion per day. The question is, are their patients feeling better or are they actually doing worse? So despite the fact that so much of money and efforts are being spent on health, the patients are not doing any better. The problem is that what the doctors want to be done to their patients is very different from what they would want to be done to, towards them. And that's the whole crux of the matter in the sense that if the doctor can understand what he wants to be done to himself and does the same to the patient, then probably the quality of life of that particular patient will be much better. And that's the reason why um, we have changed from evidence-based to um, value-based medicine where we are now talking about quality of life more commonly and basing our, basing our decisions as far as management of patients is concerned based on what is going to affect their quality of life in the long run. So the factors affecting um, the quality of life of any patient, especially a glaucoma patient, would depend upon what age, what gender, his educational qualifications, the socioeconomic status he comes from, the, the stage of the disease, whether he has access to therapy or not, what is his income? What, are the, what is the role of surgery? What does he apprehend? And finally, of course, the psychosocial variations are so many. I mean, you can ask one patient, you know, like it was said, ki, aap kaise, uh, how are you feeling? One patient who is blind may say, oh, I'm fine. Another patient who is like 6'6 six, six vision has all everything down and he's, he's totally depressed. So the, the way patients respond to their treatment and the way the patients um, respond to their um, 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 uh, surgery is so very different. And that is all that quality of life um, means. So, so uh, in a glaucoma patient, obviously it would depend upon the visual deficit the patient has, the fact that he needs therapy for long, the fact that there is no cure and, the, and there is always this anxiety that they might go blind. This study from, from Scandinavia showed that, um, that, the, that, the, that the life, uh, the expectancy of these patients of glaucoma is also much lower than that of any other um, patients with, uh, with, who are healthy or who have other kinds of eye, eye problems. So the quality of life definitely of our glaucoma patients is poor, there is no doubt about it, but how can we measure that quality of life is very different. 
You can, there are a lot of questionnaires which are very complicated. They have, they have 20, 30, 60 questionnaires which are vision specific, glaucoma specific. But what is most, most interesting is you need to know in totality how is that disease like glaucoma affecting the quality of life. And so there is one particular value or the utility value that is commonly used and we use that in, in uh, asking the patients um, how they were feeling and then you could actually objectivize, you know. So what we ask them is of the remaining years of your life, how many years are you willing to give up to get perfect vision, you know. And so um, there, there were different answers and you would be surprised that um, you could grade this from zero to one. Zero would be like death or blindness and one would be a perfect vision or a perfect state of health. And it would be surprising that a lot of our patients with advanced glaucoma said, you know, I, doctor, I would rather be dead than be blind. So, which is really sad because that means the quality of life of a blind person or a patient who is anxious to go, go that he might go blind is really very poor. And so we have to um, um, make every effort to make that um, the, 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 the whole disease look better rather than looking worse. You know, that is the whole concept. So rather than telling them that they're, they're going to go blind, as someone said, let's not use the term blind very loosely. Let's, let's use it in a very positive manner so that at least the patients feel good. So when we, um, uh, when we asked this questionnaire to a lot of these um, adult glaucoma patients, surprisingly we found that the quality of life of our patients who had advanced glaucoma was much lower compared to, let's say, from America. And there could be very reas many reasons. One could be that what we studied were, were re really advanced glaucomas. Other reasons could also be the, the, fa the fact that these patients don't have social security. They um, do not have the knowledge about the disease. The fact that they have to come from long distances, travel and all, and so many other family considerations that have to be taken into account. And in our country, a lot of this is, is generally neglected. And when you compare this quality of life with other diseases like cancer, with, uh, with coronary artery disease, you know, it's so much, much like that. So, so our glaucoma patients feel that their quality of life is not very good as far as the adult glaucoma patients is concerned, which is really sad. And there are studies in the West where they have looked at their driving abilities, their walking abilities, the fact that they are getting into accidents and all. And all of these have shown that, of course, with, as the disease advances, all of these calamities increase. But in a glaucoma patient who has a, a problem, even in the early forms of the disease, there could be um, um, a lot of decrease in the quality of life. What is interesting is that the quality of life is directly proportional to the vision of the patient. So if the vision of the patient is going down, let's say from 6'6", six, six, he may have a, a very small 10 degree vision field. But as long as his vision is good, his quality of life is good. But once his vision starts going down and he can't see the central field so well, that's when his quality of life starts going down. And this is, is the American quality of life. But if you compare that with Indians, you find that our quality of life for the same kind of vision is much poorer. So obviously the quality of life of our patients is poorer. And there could be many reasons, as I just told you, it could be an anxiety of, about the fact that you know, they have a blinding disease, about the fact that they have to take medicines for long. That is the very, very important factor, that the lifelong therapy, to have to go there, buy medicines, to put the medicines. A lot of them don't even have money to, to even travel to come to the doctor. So this is, this is, these are all the very important considerations when one considers uh, the quality of life of a patient. So probably then in advanced glaucoma, I think we should always err on the side of doing surgery rather than you know, thinking of medical therapy if the patient has a lot of such problems. Of course, illiteracy about the disease, and that is where the doctor comes in when the ophthalmologist or the glaucoma specialist has to talk to the patient and make them understand that you know, it's not a blinding disease, that if the pressures are well controlled, a lot of these patients can live like a normal uh, person. So this is what you need to emphasize. Another interesting thing that we did was to look at quality of life of young patients, patients who were less than 40 years. A lot of our patients, our population is not um, a population of older um, age. Our population is primarily that of young people, you know, and a lot of glaucoma is happening in young people. And when we compare the quality of life of young patients with those of the uh, uh, older um, age, we found that the younger people probably with the same kind of disease, same um, severity of disease, 
were not so much affected by the fact that they had glaucoma compared to the older patients. And there could be many reasons. There could be the fact that, you know, these younger patients didn't understand the consequences of the disease or for the fact that they had a good social security system in their parents and, and, and other people around them, or also probably that these patients were not so much bothered about the uh, disease as an older patient would who has other comorbid conditions like diabetes, hypertension, and all. So the younger patients are not so much affected by, by their glaucoma. But then the corollary to that would be that if they are not affected, then probably they are taking the disease very lightly and are less likely to follow up and less likely to put their medicines be less compliant. So, so this is also very important and has to be taken into consideration when one is talking about the quality of life. So to conclude, I could say that, that our patients are obviously not as, are, are not as happy or not as good as probably the patients in, in the Western world. And that visual acuity is something that they're really concerned about and has to be maintained. You know, even if, if their visual field is gone, at least you can maintain their, their vision, which, 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 which is a primary concern for the patient. And those, of course, with the lower educational status will always have a poor quality of life, and you have to explain about the disease to these patients to make them feel better. And finally, we need studies where we can compare um, um, the economic benefits of our treatment with other diseases, let's say coronary artery disease, cancer, or many other diseases in population, so that we can go and tell the health prof um, administrators or those sitting in the ministry that, you know, look here, there is a disease which is blinding and is, and is causing a quality of life of patients much poorer than other diseases and therefore must be given more importance. So these need to be stressed and, and, um, and probably as ophthalmologists and as glaucoma specialists, we probably have a big role to play um, in, in, in bringing um, uh, this to the awareness of, of the general po population. So the quality of life um, includes many things apart from vision and have to be taken into consideration in, in, and, and make the patients a part of, of the entire decision making so that um, they become more of your friends rather than your patients. And as someone said, health is not a goal of life but only a means to achieve it. So um, a very important thing that you need to um, tell to the patients so that um, you know, they don't feel so bad. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Dr. Vinay. And uh, I... Uh, I uh, request anyone who would like to ask a question, but uh, yes, anyone? Or uh, yes, yes, please. I'm very glad you asked that question because low vision aid is something which is very much uh, left, you know, left out of the purview of both ophthalmologists and optometrists. And very few people are already doing low vision. And now with the era of computers, you know, it's not that difficult. However, when you have glaucoma, you have tunnel vision. The problem is more with the navigational. So it's just like retinitis pigmentosa. And in addition, the glaucoma people have poor contrast. So it's age, contrast, and the tunnel vision, which is there. So just the, uh, the near vision aids, like computerized aids, will just help in the reading. But for navigational mobility, the only thing which helps is, is increasing the contrast, which is that they should only travel with lighted, you know, they should have light in hand always, a flashlight or whatever, where they should not venture out in the dark. Or if they venture out, they should have somebody with them because falls are very common with these elderly people who have this, you know, navigational limitation. So one is light, if you could light. And very often you'll find in most of these places where you have these, um, for distance vision. Near vision, you have these lot of near vision aids and with the patients, with, we very really happily use whether it is a CCTV one or it's just a prismatic number of glasses. But for the peripheral vision, prismatic glasses don't work that well. It only works well for hemi and opia patient. For glaucoma, the navigational tools of movement and very often now you'll find what I was saying was that most of these places where they are geared up for low vision, you'll have a different colored tiles. Uh, in metro stations or, or anywhere else also with the, where there's a contrast, dif a very palpable difference in contrast, which even the poor contrast patients can pick up for navigation. And that's important for the glaucoma patients. Anyone would like to know something about what, I mean like, or rather I invite the house to please tell me, what advice do you all give to your patients of advanced glaucoma re regarding nutrition and exercise? Would anyone like to contribute? Uh, I don't know how 
much it affects, but for yoga patients who are doing pranayams and all that, I feel it does affect the pressures that affect the eye or when they are doing shisasana or something. Most of the people do that in our uh, setup where I come from. So I tell them to prevent those exercises. Okay. Probably that helps. What about walking? Do you advise a patient to walk? Yeah, normal other things I allow them to do, but uh, these I tell them to avoid. And when you, when they are walking, then what uh, specific should, advice do you give them when they are walking they on the roads? They should not over exceed, means they should not be very tired when they are walking or sweating, means they should not have heavy breathing. Normal walk they can do, I feel. Thank you. Dr. Sunita, would you like to add something on this particular issue? Because there's some, a question that people ask. Huh? Breath holding exercise, uh, exercises, pranayam and all are avoid, should be avoided. Shirshasan in any case, I don't think anyone does full, full Shirshasan nowadays, but it should be avoided and his patient should be instructed not to, not to do it. And as far as like I remember, one should always instruct patient not to drink water because it's a routine habit for people to drink three, four glasses of water in the morning. So I think it should be a strict no-no because we have seen patients rising after having um, uh, taken so much water at a time. So you should be like, as a part of instruction, one should, patient should be instructed not to drink water in one go in the morning or any time. And because most of the patients I've seen, they don't know about it. So, and yoga also is a frequent practice nowadays. So yoga, drinking water, I think all these things should be instructed. I would like to add something, Sagar. Uh, yeah. yeah. They can, they, what the Kapal Bharti exercise in yoga, you have a lot of exercises. I think pranayam overall is good for the, we must remember we're not just treating glaucoma, we're treating the patient as a whole. So if he has COPD or hypertension or diabetes, it's not helping the glaucoma at all. So the pranayam or the exercises do definitely help the systemic body as a whole, which will ultimately affect the eye. So don't let them stop that. That gives them a purpose also. It makes them you know, feel that they are doing something for their health and that positivity is important to be reinforced. But Kapal Bharti, especially when you have these, you know, the forceful breathing out, that you should stop them. Shishasana, as I said, nobody really does it. And these drinking of four, five, one with honey and one with neem juice and one with this constant, they don't take it together. And walking again, subay morning walk mein jana hai, morning walk should be only after sunrise. I mean, it should not be because in the, they have limited navigational modality and they can again fall down in this thing. So don't stop their activities, just modify it. Ki, okay, when you take tea, uske baad chale jao. So it, when the sun is out around 7.30 or 7, not at 5.30 or 6, and these laughter club things which have come up, you know, is very common. They have these ha-ha, and you know, that that one should be a little bit avoid because they cause a lot of uh, pressure changes. So they should be a smiling club rather than a laughter club. And if they walk, very often some patients say, Kaun leke jayega? Mere shidiya hai in Delhi. We are staying in Delhi where you know, climbing, they don't have a bungalow or something. So those patients, you can advise them to walk at home because they are very familiar with their territories of home. But keep walking. I just tell them, just keep walking and just keep doing your activities. Don't stop doing whatever you have to do. What uh, particular advice would the entire house, I'm asking the entire house, would you like to give to a patient, let's say, for example, he has to go to the market. A patient with advanced glaucoma has to go to the market. So would you like to give him some particular type of advice? He's got to cross a busy road, let's say Delhi or any other place now in India. They're very busy roads. So where would you like to walk? I mean, towards the side of the road, towards the pavement, where? I mean, that's very important, I think, because patients with advanced glaucoma are having a problem their peripheral vision has gone completely. They cannot see anything which is coming from the sides, perhaps. They only have that tunnel vision. So I always advise my patients that do go for a walk. You must go for a walk. It helps you in the long run in every other aspect. But please have someone walking on the side where the traffic is flowing so that at least you're protected. We get many accident cases, and ultimately you realize that there's nothing but the patient has had advanced glaucoma. Uh, one more question that I again request, there are lots of uh, glaucoma stalwarts sitting in the hall and I'm so happy to see them, but would you like to do a glaucoma drainage device as a primary procedure for advanced glaucoma? Yes. 
Anyone else for any other? Because I think this is something, a consensus which everyone, I think, uh, realizes and accepts. Yeah, I think we are not doing as a primary procedure in primary glaucomas. In secondary glaucomas, it can be done as primary uh, procedure. Anyone else would like to ask any question? Ma'am. when we see you know, more than 30 or 40 percent of the patients coming to us with advanced glaucomas. I think the, the message that I would like to give is that you know, about four or five years ago, we looked at our five-year data, uh, looking at glaucoma over the entire spectrum, early, moderate, and severe, and what we found was that the severe did the best because we were so keen on keeping the pressure at 10, actually very few of them progressed. We are now doing a much larger study on a 10-year follow-up and I think the results are pretty much the same. So even if the patient comes to you with advanced glaucoma, I think your message should be, if you are compliant and if you come back regularly, nothing is going to happen to you. I, this, is, this is from practical experience, and I think Dr. Vinay would also see that you know, in, even in juvenile glaucoma, so many of them come with advanced glaucoma. If you can convince them that this is the way to go, this is the pressure that we need, this is the help we need from you, you can actually prevent progression. So I think advanced glaucoma, it's, a, it's not good to have, but if you do have it and treat it well, it does well in the long term. Thank you so much. I thank the entire faculty. I thank so many people and the participants and the great interactive session that we've had. And um, I think advanced glaucoma is something that we need to deal with, and we should be clear in our minds as how we are going to treat our patients with advanced glaucomas. Once again, the end of the session, I once again thank all the soldiers who are fighting for us because I am from the Army and I know a lot of people from the Army are here. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all for interacting. And thank you all faculty for all your active participation. <laughs>